Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Sunday Morning Science. I am your host, John Perry. I don't have a guest today. Sometimes we have guests, sometimes we don't. I'm actually, I'm very excited about today because I'm going to take you on an internet safari. <laughs> I'm going to, something that I do from time to time is I will just get on, uh, get on the internet, start, start doing, start reading papers, start doing Google image searches, and uh, just learn about wildlife. And this is kind of actually how I've educated myself in biology over the years. I mean, I, I, I studied biology in college, but it actually was not my focus. And uh, it's amazing how, how much information you can glean by just kind of going down rabbit hole after rabbit hole and asking more questions digging a little bit deeper. So today's video is Evolutionary Oddities, Misfits, and Living Transitions. And before I start my slideshow here that I've, I've prepared for you, I wanted to, uh, this week I made chocolate chip cookies and I was thinking about uh, the different ingredients in a chocolate chip cookie. And how many species are in a chocolate chip cookie? And I just wanted to uh, get your guess, without Googling it, how many species do you think exist inside of a chocolate chip cookie? The normal ingredients for a simple chocolate chip cookie. So if you can think about that and uh, write your comments in the, in the chat here, here in, well, at, at the end of, the, of today's show, We'll talk about that in uh, in detail, and I'll I'll reveal the answer. So, how many species are in a chocolate chip cookie? We'll talk about it about that at the end. But first, let's take a look at these these organisms, these crazy misfits of evolution. All right, here we go. There's my slides. So this first critter is a really interesting one. This is a three-toed yellow-bellied skink, and this species is native to Australia. And there's actually lots of skinks that live in different uh, parts of the world, really. Lots of them are in Australia. I'm not sure if that's where they originated or um, and then they dispersed. I actually don't know, but the most common type of skink and well let me here's here's another picture of the same species there's a there's an adult and a juvenile uh, down here in this picture and you can see that they actually have four legs but their their legs are tiny and uh, we'll, we'll talk about why their legs are so small later but just skinks in general uh, well, there's another picture of it you can see that it's called the, the three-toed skink because it has three toes on each of its legs there. The most common version, or the most common species of skink, or actually I guess it's group of species of skink, would be the, uh, the blue-tailed, or the blue-tongued skink. And they're the most well-known because they're, you'll find them in pet stores. And we've done a lot of selective breeding with them. They come in all sorts of colors. And they're called the blue-tongued skink because they have a blue tongue. And they use it to display, supposedly this is threatening when they when they stick their tongue out. It, that's scary. I don't know why this works, but somehow enough organisms were scared of a lizard sticking its tongue out that this trait evolved. And when this this animal is threatened, it will stick out its tongue and try to scare you. And I'm not sure if this evolved because it worked to scare predators or if it evolved as signaling between members of the same species it's it's a, a threat to other members of the same species but the males and the females both have blue tongues so far as I know correct me if I'm wrong but uh, let's see oh, we're, we're getting some guesses on the on the chocolate chip cookies how many species there are in a chocolate chip cookie we got 10 we got 42. <laughs> Good guess, 42. 
So anyway, the, the blue-tongued skink. Uh, here's another really beautiful picture of one that, look at that tongue, that is crazy. It's crazy that this, this vibrant blue, it works for something. Natural selection has, has magnified this coloration. Not all of them have, have tongues this vibrant, but that is quite spectacular. There's a lot of different species of the blue-tongued skink and a lot of different variations that breeders have, have come up with by mixing different, different subspecies and by just doing selective breeding like you would with a dog to get different colorations. So this is a really pretty version. This is, uh, you know, I don't know if you'd call it an albino, but it's, uh, it's missing all of the reddish pigment. It's really cool looking. And <laughs> here's, here's a, a wild specimen doing his threat display. Very intimidating. Again, I have no clue how, uh, what, what species finds that intimidating. Maybe it's just other members of this species that find it intimidating. Maybe there's some sort of predator that's scared of that too. Super, super interesting. But anyway, back to the skink in question. This is the yellow-bellied three-toed skink. And in 2010, it was found that this is much more interesting than anyone ever thought before. We found out that this species is a transition, in transition between egg laying and giving live birth. And what they found is that the, the specimens in a, in a population on the coast, they will lay eggs and those eggs take about 10 to 15 days to hatch. So they're actually pretty quick and, and they're, they hatch fairly quickly because they're actually storing the eggs in their bodies. We found a, a second population that hatches their eggs in between five and three days. So much, much faster. And their eggshells are a lot softer and they withhold their eggs inside the body for a much longer period of time. And then we found a, a mountain population and a much colder climate that actually gives live birth. Their babies are born live. And after their babies are born, uh, bits of uh, membrane, of eggshell membrane, very thin eggshell membrane are excreted as well. So this is a species in transition from laying eggs to giving live birth. And we think that the, the selection pressure that's causing this, we think that the reason this is happening is that this species is, oh, it's up in the mountains. And if you lay eggs in a cold climate, the, those eggs have a chance of freezing to death. Uh, not necessarily freezing in ice, but it, just the temperature being so cold that the eggs are not viable. And so this species has been retain, retaining its eggs longer and longer so that the, the embryos can be more and more developed until finally you actually have live birth happening with this particular species of skink. And so far as we know, they can all interbreed. All these three populations can interbreed with each other and have viable offspring. And one, uh, one female was actually seen giving live birth to several live babies and then laying several eggs which hatched a few days later. So this is really a species in transition. I find this absolutely fascinating. I mean, that we think of live birth and egg laying as these completely separate things, but here we have a species that can do both. And it seems to do both depending on the environmental circumstances. Now, there's a lot of things we don't know about this. We don't know if... Uh, if it can actually change its behavior according to the climate. So one individual could lay eggs in a warm climate and would uh, retain those eggs in a colder climate. We don't know that. We don't know if it's a genetic tendency, if there's there's a, an allele, so a, a different version of, of, of genes that cause the egg laying versus the uh, live birth. We just, we, we don't know. But it's super fascinating to see this happening. Again, we, we had this, this, this one observation of a female giving both live birth and laying eggs in the same, in the same batch of babies. So super interesting, super weird 
misfit, evolutionary misfit, living transition between egg laying and live birth. And you probably noticed here that not only is it weird in the fact that it, it does this live birth type thing, but it also, <laughs> it looks kind of like it's trying to turn into a snake like organism. And this is actually really common in reptiles that live in leaf litter and do a lot of, or that do a lot of burrowing. That it, it, if you are a burrowing animal and you burrow in soft soil, so things like leaf litter or sand, a lot of times you end up digging with your face and your arms and legs sort of become like a problem for you. And we see time and time again, we see reptiles going from a, a, a lizard-like body with very strong, robust arms and then transitioning into a snake-like situation where you have very, very small arms and uh, sometimes no arms. And there's actually a species of skink, several species of skink. So here, here we have again, that this is the same, uh, this is the three-toed skink from the top view. And you see very, very, very small little legs, almost useless little legs. And then there is a species of skink called the legless skink, which is, of course, legless. And this thing completely just depends on digging with its head and squirming through uh, loose soil and leaf litter, very much like a snake. Super interesting, this transition. And again, you know, we have the very lizard-like uh, skink species. This is the, again, the, the blue-tongued skink of Australia. And then we have the three-toed skink, and then we have the legless skink. Super interesting to see these things. So we've got a couple questions. We've got a, uh, again, if you have a question, the, the best thing to do is to, is to write at stated casually and, and make sure you, you put a space in there and then that will highlight it in the, the uh, live feed that I'm looking at as I'm uh, doing this presentation so I can see your question. Why did egg laying make it through evolution? Eggs are always at the danger, at a danger of being eaten. Yeah, that is true. Eggs are at a danger of being eaten. However, there's lots of good ways to hide eggs. Um, lots of ways to hide eggs. Uh, a lot of uh, organisms will will excrete uh, things that, that hide the scent of eggs. Pe organisms will bury eggs. So you've probably seen uh, turtles on the beach, sea turtles on the beach that are burying their eggs. It's actually pretty rare for those eggs to be dug up. I mean, sometimes you'll see raccoons go and dig them up, but on a lot of the islands that they choose, they choose places where they're not going to be dug up. Uh, chickens and other animals, of course, they guard their eggs. And uh, it's just a lot... Uh, it's a, it is a lot more efficient in, in certain ways. There, there are trade-offs, right? <clears throat> If you lay your eggs, you don't have to carry them anymore. So you can go out and get food. If you're, if you're hiding your eggs well, you, you can actually just leave them alone, which is nice. You don't have to even bother with anything. So sea turtles do that. They bury them and then, then they go off on their merry way. If you are like a chicken, <laughs> you can sit on your eggs and then go out and feed and then go sit on your eggs and then go out and feed. And you don't have to carry them around inside your body, which could be... Uh, that could be a problem, especially if you're a bird and you need to fly around. Having those eggs inside of you, is, that's a lot of weight. It's, there's a lot of reasons why eggs, egg laying is good. It, everything's a trade-off in evolution. And it, it appears that these, these reptiles, they've evolved these, this ability to give live birth and, and they retain their eggs probably so that they can maintain warmth. That's that's what we think the selection pressure is that's causing this. You know, reptiles, of course, are cold-blooded, but when they move around, they move their muscles. That heats up their body temperature. And, of course, they can, they can move into the sun and keep themselves warmer that way as well. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of ways that a cold-blooded animal can keep itself warm. And we think that that's what's happening here. Uh, 
it's also possible that the the real selection pressure that's causing this this ability to to give live birth in this skink maybe maybe there's just more predators egg predators in the mountain region than there are in the coastal region and scientists have been misled so they, they thought it was the temperature but actually it's, it's predation that that is a possibility we actually have a lot of different snake species and several different reptiles that have evolved the ability to give live birth and mainly that's done by retaining their eggs so instead of having a, a full-on placenta like like we do they just maintain their eggs longer so that's kind of like the the poor man's um live birth method is just that you actually do produce eggs but you keep them inside of you and then you release them later I, poor man I, poor poor woman <laughs> the it's it's the cheap easy way to live birth Let's see eggs contain a lot of cholesterol and most species are actually very healthy and tend to avoid eating eggs except for saturdays the traditional cheat day in nature that's what uh, joda hack has to say here um, that first question, by the way, about about egg laying came from um, Gorab Sharma. Hopefully, I'm saying your name right. And Smith says they turned off distal aminos. And Diaphorus says so. Bearing eggs are not caused by a random mutation, and because it worked, it became the norm for future generations in reptilia. Um, well, all of the changes that we see, I mean, trying to say that everything in evolution happens because of random mutations is a little bit wrong. Uh, the word random <laughs> is a little bit strange here because, uh, there are lots of parts of the genome that are protected from mutation more than others. So when we say that a mutation is purely random, that's not completely correct. But yeah, most most evolutionary changes happen from what we could call random mutations. And by random, I mean there's no foresight. The, the mutation isn't, isn't caused with any sort of knowledge of what the needs are. These mutations arise, they cause variations in traits, and then those traits are selected either for or against. And so yeah, that, that, is, that is how egg laying uh, works. Egg laying uh, is the more ancient trait. Giving live birth is more complicated. Keeping that egg inside your body as it develops is more complicated than, than um, egg laying. So that the live birth is a new thing on the earth. Uh, most early organisms were actually secreting eggs and sperm and those would meet in the water so if you look at sponges for example which are the most primitive animals they're actually excreting their eggs and they're excreting their sperm and the egg and sperm meet up in in the open ocean and then the egg starts to develop into an organism and a lot of fish do that too it's 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 external fertilization so the fish will spray out their eggs and the males will spray out their sperm and the actual fertilization happens in the water. And the, the internal fertilization where the egg is, is kept inside the body and is fertilized inside the body, that's new. That's evolutionarily new. And then, of course, keeping the, uh, letting that embryo develop inside the body, that's even newer still. And, you know, our, our ancestors, mammals come from reptilian ancestors, amniotes which were egg laying organisms and they could actually lay their eggs on land. This was a big, uh, a big significant transition in the evolution of life on earth is the ability to, to lay eggs that are in, in water and that have to be in water to be able to lay eggs on land. And this required the evolution of what we call the amniotic sac, which is a sac inside the egg that helps uh, prevent water from leaking out of the egg. And that allows an egg to be laid on land. And so our, our ancient ancestors actually laid eggs. And there are still mammals today that lay eggs. The, uh, the platypus and the, there's another one that's related to the platypus that's the echidna. Uh, those both lay eggs still. And they're kind of leathery, reptile-like eggs. And uh, 
So yeah, the, the, this transition from egg laying to live birth has happened many times throughout evolutionary history. Oh, oh look, someone's up. Uh, ah, Rana, hopefully I'm saying your name right, asks, why do platypus lay eggs even as mammals? Are they transitioning backwards? No, they're not transitioning backwards. They're actually a primitive, they're actually using the primitive version of uh, reproduction in mammals. So we think that all mammals at one time were egg layers. Then you have the marsupials, which uh, they don't, they, they give birth extremely early. And then the, the, it's really, it's a fetus still when it's born and it climbs into a pouch where it's then uh, nursed until it develops, which is totally weird. And then you have placental mammals that actually have a placenta that nourishes the baby until it's born. And that placenta is a, it's a very complex structure and it, it's, it's a, uh, <laughs> we actually have an egg yolk at a certain point in our development as well. We actually do have an egg yolk. If you look at uh, human embryos and all placental mammals, we actually have an egg yolk that we draw nutrition off of before the placenta fully kicks in and giving us our nutrients. Super interesting. Kind of like a, a leftover remnant there. Did live birth in mammals start with maintaining eggs inside? Yeah, we think so because we actually still have this, this uh, we still have an amniotic sac. So we don't have, we don't have this, this calcium egg shell or th th this rough egg shell that, that does not exist at all in placental mammals, but we still do have the amniotic sac and we still do have the egg yolk that develops. Uh, and that question came from shelled reptile. Has the reverse tradition ever happened that we know about? So I, I guess that would be from going from live birth to um, egg laying. I actually don't know. I don't know if, especially once once you fully get rid of the egg shell, can you gain it back again? I don't know. I don't. I don't know of any instance of that happening. But in this transition that we're looking at right here with the uh, with the skink, that could definitely happen because some of them are still laying eggs and giving live birth. And so if it became, if, if the environment changed to where selection pressure was favoring the laying of eggs, definitely this, this skink right here, the, the uh, three-toed skink, that could definitely just go back into full on egg laying and, and you know, <laughs> Biologists in the distant future wouldn't be able to tell this ever this little transition ever happened at all It would be completely invisible to them. So uh, that's pretty interesting So this brings us to that was our our misfit number one of the day nice beautiful transitional species and again like this is kind of a What I call my, my internet safari. I, I like to go down these rabbit holes sometimes where I just start reading about animals and keep going going down this pathway and this all got started because i i do presentations with high schools and by the way if you are a high school teacher and you want me to do, to do a presentation in your online classes right now during covid i'm happy to do so send me an email john at stated clearly and we'll set that up but i had actually done one in seattle this last week just through through um well through zoom and the students were asking me questions about you know uh, living transitions and that got me I, I had prepared in, in advance started looking at this stuff and uh, that kind of started this me on this this evolutionary online safari that I went down and that I'm sharing with you today so it's it's pretty fun stuff so so we, we got that we we, we, we kind of covered this transition from egg laying to live birth. We've, we've covered this transition of legless to non, or sorry, of, of legged reptile to legless reptile. And this probably happened in a similar way with snakes. We actually don't know if snakes lost their legs because they were burrowing or if they lost their legs because they were aquatic. 
Uh, sometimes it happens to aquatic animals as well. Like we, we've seen with whales, whales have lost their hind legs. And so there's actually some speculation in the fossil record of snakes that snakes lost their legs because they went marine for a, a, a brief period. You know, nowadays we only have a couple of different marine species of snakes, but we, in the past, there were a lot more. And we actually think that might have been how they lost their legs, but that's actually up for debate. It's hard to tell in the fossil record. In the fossil record, we have a lot of snakes, and you can tell a snake from a different different types of reptiles by their skull. Um, their their skull structure is very different. Their they don't have eyelids, for example, so the the skink can blink its eye. Even though it looks like a snake, you can tell it's not a snake because it blinks its eye. And there's a bunch of other little anatomical clues that it's not a snake if you open it up. But, um, yeah, w with snakes, we're not sure if they lost their legs from burrowing or from going marine. But anyway, now we are going to look at a really, really interesting group of animals called squat lobsters. And squat lobsters are interesting because they gave rise to several weird animals that were very, f some of which we're very familiar with and some of which we only learned about uh, in 2005. So uh, this, is, this is really fun to, to, to think about. So squat lobsters, there, there are hundreds of species of squat lobster. And a squat lobster, they're called squat lobsters because they're like lobsters, but their tails are small. <laughs> and... Lots of different species. From the top, they look like this. They, they usually have their tail curled underneath, so you can't really see it. And they kind of look like crabs. A lot of times people will call them crabs, but, but they're actually more closely re related to lobsters. And you can see that in the length of their, uh, you know, antenna on the, on the front there. And again, like I said, there's many species. Here's one with its tail out. Kind of looks a little bit like a lobster, a little bit more like a lobster. And here's one with a bigger, a bigger um, nose. And you know, I, I don't know much about this. I've just, I've just been observing this during my internet safaris. But I noticed that they have a lot of them have this triangular shape on the top of their their head that faces forward. And in some species, it's very pronounced. So in this one, it's like you know, here we have a, a series of spikes, and here we have those spikes are all fused together to form basically like a triangle on the top of the head facing forward. I think that's really interesting. And trying to figure out why that is. I mean, why is that? has that evolved? I, I have no clue. <laughs> but it's just an interesting observation I've been making. And another interesting observation that I've been making is that all of these squat lobsters, and really this is true of all decapods, of all, you know, crabs and lobsters in general, is that they have a lot of hairs on their arms. All of them have little hairs and they have spikes. And it seems like these spikes that are on their arms evolve into hairs in some situations. And those hairs are used to sense, and th those are sensory organs. The, they, their nervous system can pick up when those hairs are bent. And that's how, one of the ways that they sense their, their environment. So they've got antenna, but they've also got these hairs on their claws and so on. Sorry, get a little little sip of coffee here. So here's another species. Very, they, they come in every color. Squat lobsters are amazing. If you get online and start looking them up, they're, it's spectacular what you're gonna find there. <laughs> here's a really funny one. Extra hairy on the arms there, and just bizarre coloration. Tiny little guy. Here we see an even hairier squat lobster still, and this is called the hairy squat lobster. And again, these hairs are used as sensory organs. And so we have some that have spikes and we can, the spikes are used as defense. When they're really fine and bendable, they're used as sensory organs. And so you have what is called in evolutionary science, an exaptation. So an organ that's being used or a structure being used for one thing is then used for a different thing and a closely related species. So most parts of your body can be used for multiple things. You know, your hands can be used to fight a war or build a house or comfort, comfort a puppy. And whatever ends up being most useful for your survival and reproduction, natural selection can actually exaggerate 
uh, those those aspects of an organ or a structure over evolutionary time. And, and so in this particular species of uh, squat lobster, we see this exaggeration of, of this sensory ability that, that these spikes are able to, to be used for. So what, what was probably used as a defense mechanism in the past is now being used as a sensory organ uh, in this particular species. <laughs> But if you think this is crazy, with all of these hairs, wait until you see this guy. This is the guy that was on our thumbnail here. And this is known as the Yeti lobster. And it was discovered in 2005. Sometimes it's called the Yeti crab. But 2005, it was discovered. And this thing lives at the bottom of the ocean next to these sea vents. And it uses its hairs not just to sense its environment, not as a defense, but it uses them <laughs> as a farm. It is growing bacteria on these hairs, and then it will scrape its arms. So it does it, it does this it does this motion where it, it puts its arms out above a vent and it's actually it's getting the the bacteria that live on it are actually they eat <laughs> the molecules that are excreted from these vents, these undersea vents. So they're, I can't remember how you call this. It's like a, they're bacteria that, that they don't use photosynthesis. They don't, um, they don't eat other organisms. They metabolize these molecules that come out of the, the earth's crust. And so they're, yeah, they're, they just eat chemistry. And this, this crab will put out its its arms over these uh, these heat vents, and allow this bacteria to grow. And then it will scrape the bacteria off. And it's got special mouth mouth parts that help it do this as well. It'll scrape the bacteria off, and then it will eat those bacteria. And it actually makes its living by eating the stuff that grows on its arm hairs. And this is just the most bizarre bizarre way of making a living that I have ever come across. So this is the Yeti lobster. And they, they will eat other things as well. But I just, just, <laughs> just imagine the anxiety you must feel uh, waiting for enough stuff to grow on your arm for you to scrape it off and eat it. You know, you're getting hungry and you got a decent colony going there. But of course, with bacteria, the more there are, the faster they reproduce. And so there's got to be a trade-off where there's um there's enough to eat to to quench your hunger but also if you eat them then you're you're going to hurt yourself in the future because you're going to stop their ability to reproduce fast enough to give you food in the future so there there, there must be <laughs> there must be this anxiety that this crab feels about when he should eat his <laughs> his growing bacteria. And I just find this really fun to think about. Like <laughs> to them, this is completely normal. And I, the, the other thing that I've been thinking about when I, with all these weird organisms that I've been, I've been paying attention to lately, I like to think that what if it was this crab that became the sentient being that invented biology, right? And the, the study of organisms they would think that they're the normal thing and that everything else is weird. Um, and I just find that amusing. And I find it interesting. Ah, um, Norio Cristino tells me that it's, it's called chemosynthetic bacteria. So yes, thank you. They're, they're metabolizing, uh, molecules in their environment instead of actually producing instead of eating other organisms or using photosynthesis to build sugar they're actually they're using the chemistry of their environment to synthesize eventually synthesize sugars anyway what what i was saying is that uh i just find this really fascinating and and a lot of times we have this we have this because we're humans and because we like ourselves and we think a lot about ourselves we like to think that we're normal, but we're not normal. We are just as weird as this crab. We're, we, we are one species of primate that somehow 
manage to invent biology and think about our place in our ecosystems. And we think that we're normal because we are so normal to ourselves, right? We're, we're obsessed with ourselves. We're obsessed with interacting with other humans, but we are, we really are as bizarre as this Yeti crab. It's just that we, we, we don't realize this because we're, we're everything that we know, right? Uh, Tim Smith says it's evolution. The most successful species survives in their environment. Yeah. So back to my slides here. Here is a group of these these uh, yeti crabs, yeti lobsters, hanging out uh, in their actual ecosystem. You can see actually that that and when they're alive, they're a lot more uh, decorated in hairs all over their body. In fact. And the, uh, the dead specimen here, I think this is, a, I'm pretty sure this is a dead specimen. This is the one that was collected. Uh, a lot of the hairs have been lost on its body, but in the, or maybe it's just a juvenile thing, but in the, in the, this photo here, which, which was taken by a submarine, I think a robotic submarine, you can see they're actually very, very covered in hairs and they can probably harvest from their whole body, I would imagine. And there's also a species of shrimp. Another thing to note here is that they're completely white, which is abnormal for the for for squat lobsters in general. They're usually very colorful, but this this group is white, and this is true of all of the crustaceans that live on the bottom of the ocean, and that's because there's no light there, so there's no reason for them to be signaling to each other with color. A lot of the coloration that you see is is actually it's signaling. So the species the the individuals are trying to communicate with each other through color. And a lot of times you'll see in the ocean, you, you see brighter colors than, than you see typically on land. And the reason for that is that it's hard to transmit color through the water. It's harder to transmit color through water than through water, than through air, because water is murky a lot of times. But obviously, if you live at the bottom of the ocean, there's no reason to be signaling visually because nobody can see you. <laughs> it's dark. And also there's no... There's no radiation that can affect and damage your cells, so you don't have to protect your cells with pigments. So that's why organisms at the bottom of the ocean don't bother even making pigments. Making pigments is expensive. It's metabolically expensive, so organisms lose the ability to make it over evolutionary time. Diaphora says, we are biz as bizarre as it gets. We eat dead animals, live animals, plants, even bacteria that are just as beneficial as the rest of our food, probiotics, etc. Humans are bizarre. Yeah, and when you eat cheese, you're eating a bunch of dead bacteria. And actually, we have bacteria in our guts that are digesting a lot of our food for us, and we actually eat their feces. So a lot of, uh, a lot of our nutrients comes from bacterial <laughs> droppings. Uh, even inside your own intestines. So yeah, we are, the, the way that we get nutrients is super weird, super, super weird. All right, so we learned about squat lobsters and this, this you might think is a squat lobster with a little bit of a longer tail and you're actually sort of correct. This is the close relative to the squat lobster. It is called, uh, these are the, Pylochelids, and there's a bunch of different species of, of pylochelids. Some people pronounce it pylochelids. And they're really cool because they try to find shells or sticks or bamboo to get inside of. And they spend almost all of their time hiding inside of some sort of a structure. As you can see here, this is a female guarding her eggs with her tail and inside of her structure. And some of them, some of them are more adventurous. They'll go out on their own, uh, away from their their hidey hole. But a lot of them spend almost all of their time inside of the, the seashell that they find, or inside of the stick that they find. And you're probably aware that there's another crustacean that does this, the hermit crab. And check this out. Here we have a polychelid next to a hermit crab that does not have a shell. And you might be noticing that they are insanely similar, 
in their structure, and that is because they are extremely closely related. Hermit crabs are a type of squat lobster. And they are, they are a type of squat lobster that has developed an obsession with finding shells in its environment that they then hold on to and uh, hide inside of. So here we have a hermit crab. This is the electric blue legged hermit crab. Very common in aquariums because they're really pretty and people like them. Here it is outside of its shell. Same species. And you can see that their, their tail has been... Uh, dramatically modified over time well let me let me just go back to so lobsters and other other um and 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 uh their relatives have these little appendages on the end of their tail and you can actually see that in the hermit crab that those little appendages still exist but they've lost all of their uh their scales their their armor on their tail their tails are very soft they're kind of like they look like meat boogers they're very gross looking. Uh, and not, not in all species. In some species, they actually, they're actually they actually colored and, and they actually are really pretty. But in, in this particular species, it looks very disgusting. And you'll also notice that it's, it's, it's crooked. It's not, it, it doesn't bend underneath like it does normally in lobsters. It bends to the side. And that's common in not all, but many species of hermit crab. You know, this one here, it actually curls underneath. By the way, the, this species of hermit crab here is actually, it's, it's called a blanket hermit crab because instead of putting a shell on, it actually puts on a sea anemone uh, around its abdomen. And its abdomen curls underneath instead of to the side. But So here we have one curving to the side. Here is, is what we call a Halloween hermit crab because it's orange and we're jerks. We name entire species after our relatively new holidays. But this thing is super pretty out of its shell. Here it is out of its shell. And uh, it's interesting because I actually don't... So the, the coloration on its, on its arms, that is for signaling. It's signaling to other members of its own species that it exists and that it is a member of the same species. There's lots of reasons that you want to signal um, to other members of your species that you are a member of the same species. This gives a lot of information to other members of the species. It tells them that you're probably trying to eat the same food that they eat. So if you try to live next to, next to them, you're going to have troubles with finding food because they're already doing eating the same thing you're eating. There might be, um, you might be signaling sexual maturity so that they can help you signal for a mate. There's a bunch of different things you could be signaling with these colors. And with most of these animals, we don't know what they're signaling. We, we just haven't studied them well enough to know what sorts of communication is happening here. But the reason that bizarre colors like this evolve is either for camouflage or for signaling. Uh, and in this case, we're quite certain that this is for signaling. These lobsters, these squat lobsters and hermit crabs, they have extremely good color vision. They can, they're, they're very, uh, they have very acute vision. And yeah, they they are communicating with each other. It's not clear to me, and I have not been able to read anything about this, as to whether or not the, the tail here is has actually evolved this color pattern so that it can signal or if this is just the, uh, the, the patterning from the legs going onto the tail because there's nothing genetically causing it to stop. So it's just, it just continues onward. So that's, that'd be something interesting to study, to, to, do, to do research on and to, to try and figure that out. But we, we, we don't understand genetics well enough to really understand those sorts of things very well. Um, in the future, we might be able to figure this out. But... It's, yeah, I, I imagine it's not using its tail for any sort of signaling because it's super rare for these things to be outside of their shell. The only times they'll be found outside of their shell is when they're changing shells. So when they grow too big for their current shell, they'll exchange it for a bigger one when they find one. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's possible that they actually come out of their shells and signal to each other. 
but I have not been able to find any information on that. Super beautiful animal. Here's just, I'm, I just, I went down a rabbit hole and just started looking at tons of different species of, of hermit crab here. They come in all colors. These are all marine species and marine species, again, they're brighter in general than land species. Not always, but in general. And uh, part of that is because it's harder to signal to each other in the water. Here's another Here's another guy. This is a, a, a really neat, we got orange and blue and gray here. Super, super interesting. And the, this guy looks like he's got, got zits all over his body. Pretty, pretty cool. Just <laughs> the different ways that they've evolved to signal to each other. You know, they're, I'm a member of your species. Uh, come mate or don't mess with me or you know, whatever it is that they're telling each other. It's really interesting. And then this, I actually used to have one of these. I used to have an aquarium when I was, a, when I was in high school. I had a saltwater aquarium and this is the, uh, I can't remember what it's called. The people who sold it to me called it a strawberry uh, hermit crab, but it's, it's like a, the black spotted giant hermit, I think is what it's called. Something, something like that, but they're really cool, really pretty animals. Got a couple questions here in the comments. Uh, without bacteria, I don't believe there would be any plant or animal life due to their sim uh, symbiotic relationship. What do you think? Um, so I think you might be saying that if, if bacteria went extinct, nothing else could live. That's quite possibly true. I think actually, well... Probably there are plants that could live without bacteria, but almost all plants do form some sort of symbiosis with at least fungus. But yeah, it, that'd be really interesting. If, if all bacteria went extinct, would all life go extinct? Uh, actually, probably so, because bacteria are the foundation of most ecosystems. So that's like the, the bottom of the food chain. So you would have, you would have a huge cascade of extinctions. That's for sure. Ann Smith asks, are their hairs the same as mammal hairs? No. On crustaceans, their hairs are just, uh, they're extensions of their exoskeleton. They're very different structurally from, from mammal hairs, which are cells that grow from a follicle. These do not grow from follicles. They develop underneath the shell. These hairs grow. Um, as the new shell is growing, and then when they molt, the hairs are really uh, nice and fine and intact, and they're really flexible and bendy. They start to wear down as time goes on, and so they shed their their uh, exoskeleton from t from time to time to re I guess rejuvenate their hairs. You could say so that's very different than a mammal's hair that grows continuously from a follicle from, from a follicle. Um, let's see. Is the virus DNA found in our DNA actually provide some perks to us or, they, or are they just junk for us and still helping the long gone virus DNA replication? So this is a little bit of a tangent. Um, our genomes are littered with uh, virus DNA and a lot of that DNA is actually been incorporated into our genomes and we're actually using, we actually use proteins from some of those in some cases, in other cases, uh, it's basically just dead weight in our genome. So it actually depends a lot on whether or not our ancestors have co-opted those genes for their own survival or not. Um, in the evolution of placental mammals, uh, virus genes have been co-opted to help us develop um, certain proteins that are used in the, in the placental in the placenta and i it's been a while since i read about this but i believe there are, there were also some genes that are used to suppress the immune system so the the mother's immune system does not attack the baby that i believe i believe came from a virus originally i'm not totally sure
but I believe that came from a virus. So what, our genomes, <laughs> once a gene gets inserted into an organism's genome, uh, it can really end up evolving to become a benefit to that organism, or um, it can just be dead weight. It, it depends on a lot of different... Uh, evolution is a mess. It's an absolute mess. All right. So here, here I have uh, a handful of hermit crabs that I collected from the Oregon coast. And these species are really interesting because they can't, they live in tide pools and they live on the beach and they can come out of the water to scavenge for food, but they can't stay out of the water very long because they will dry out. And when their gills dry out, they die. But because they have these shells, they can fill those shells with water and they can actually stay on land for a long time before they dry out. They, they carry with them their own little packet of water. And that's really cool. And here, the, the, the gills are actually found in this part of the back here, actually underneath their shell. They have the gills here. And if those dry out, they're, they're dead. But some species of hermit crab have actually evolved really sturdy gills and really, really waterproof exoskeletons. And they can live for a long time on land. This is, this is a specimen from Ecuador, when I was in Ecuador. And this guy... These, these guys have gills that have been modified so much that if they go into the water, they can actually drown. And it takes them a long time. They can actually spend a lot of time underwater and a lot of time on land. But if they get too much water inside of them, they will actually drown. They, the, their, their gills have been adapted in a way that they, they carry water inside their body. Those gills are inside that water inside of their body. But there's so much more oxygen in the air than there in the water that these gills, they've evolved to be more stiff so they can, they can handle uh, a drier environment. But being more stiff means that they're thicker and being thicker means that they're not as efficient at pulling in oxygen. And so they need more oxygen in order to work. And in the water, they, they'll actually, they will slowly suffocate. Drowning might be the wrong word. They'll, they'll slowly suffocate because there's not enough oxygen in the water. So they have to come out of, out of the water a lot, and they spend most of their time on land. And then you have species like this. This is a uh, Caribbean species that really cannot handle the water at all. Once it's an adult, so the juveniles are born in the ocean. Uh, they, they go through a larval stage where they're fully marine. Then they start coming out on land when they're juveniles. And then they become fully terrestrial when they're adults. And then you have the coconut crab, which starts out its life again in the ocean. Then it becomes a hermit crab that needs a shell and becomes a land hermit crab. And then it gets so big and so robust that it actually gets rid of its shell and it just lives as a shellless hermit crab on land. And these things are huge. They can be... And like, oh man, I should have, I should have looked up how big they are, but there, um, there are pictures that these will be on like, like a garbage can, a typical size trash can, not like a, not like one you'd put outside your house for garbage pickup, but a, a, a kitchen trash can. They're, they're bigger than a, a kitchen trash can. There's, there's photos of them hanging out on garbage cans for size comparison online. So if you look at these things, they're, they're the, the giant coconut um, hermit crab and they no longer use their uh, shells for safety they just they just use their own exoskeleton like a normal crustacean does for protection they're really cool animals and unfortunately they're endangered because they taste so stinking good and it takes them years to mature and so yeah they're they're going extinct but really cool animals so we We've really gone through a bunch of different transitions here. Just by looking at modern organisms, we see this crazy transition from, we saw the, the squat lobster to the, the hypotherm hydrothermal vent squat lobster. And we've seen squat lobsters to hermit crab transition that we, we have this, this intermediate species that um, doesn't always require a shell. You know, it'll hide in sticks and so on. 
Then we have hermit crabs. Some some don't require shells. Some use uh, some use sea anemones instead to protect themselves. And then we have those that are obsessed with shells, so obsessed that they they're very anxious when they don't have a shell, and they're very anxious when they're starting to get too big for their shell. And then you have hermit crabs that have said, you know what, screw this, I don't want a shell anymore. I'm just going to be a giant coconut crab and hang out on the on the beach and in the forest. And I also gave up my my life in the water. And so it's it's just really fun to see how all these transitions happen throughout evolutionary time. And it's neat with, with crustaceans because there's so many different species available still alive today that we can actually we can actually look at these transitions just by looking at modern organisms. We don't have to go in the fossil record. We can go through the fossil record and find these transitions happening there as well, but we don't have to. I mean, you can actually still see there are surviving specimens that are still living these ancient ways and that are living more modern ways and super fun to just go through and look at how this works. So here's, here's a picture that I took in Ecuador. It was a hermit crab with a shell hiding inside of a larger shell. I thought that was funny. Uh, and that was actually because I scared it and it ran and it got inside that shell. So it was, he was actually, he was a little bit too big to get inside of his own shell to, to fully hide inside of his own shell. And this shell here that he's hiding inside of is obviously way too big for him to use as his like go-to shell, but he did hide inside of it to get away from me. I thought that was funny. Okay. <laughs> Last but not least, you know, I'm, I'm, I've, I've got a lot of uh, slides here. I don't, I think I'm going to go through these a little bit faster, but <laughs> This this animal is called the a tongue fish. This is the the how do you say that? Lackner's tongue sole fish. And it's it's called the tongue fish because it looks like a tongue. And sorry, I'm getting a drink of water here. Up close, it looks like a chewed up tongue with googly eyes stuck onto it. It's really funny that that there on the side is its mouth. <laughs> Here are its gills. It is a flat fish. It's, it's, so you're probably more familiar with, you know, like flounders and halibut for flatfish. Flatfish are the, the weirdest fish. I, like they're so bizarre. Their evolution is super, super strange. They, <clears throat> When you're looking at a flatfish, you're not looking at its left side and its right side. You're actually looking at its dorsal fin and its pectoral fin. So this is actually the um, the the cloaca is right here, right here. These are the pelvic fins here. This is the uh, uh, pectoral fin. And so these fish are actually just sideways. They lay on they they lay on one of their sides. Some species lay on their left side. Some species lay on their right side, and their eyes actually migrate on their face as they develop. Uh, <laughs> they they look like Picasso paintings. These animals are hilarious to me. And here we see um, them the development of a flatfish. So they start out with when they're really young. They have an eye on the left side and on the right side of their body, like a normal fish. Then that eye starts to migrate to the top of the head, the, the right eye in this case. In some species, it's the left eye. And then it, it, it gets higher on the top of the head and starts to go onto the left side of the face until eventually you get, uh, you get a flatfish, a full-on flatfish. And here's another embryo in development. <clears throat> A little bit further in the progression. So his eyes are both on the same side of its head. And this just, <laughs> it just completely distorts their face. The bones, everything just shift around as this happens during development. <clears throat> during develop. Sorry, I'm getting a lot of, uh, my voice is starting to crack here. <clears throat> Been talking a lot. We see this in the fossil record. This is really neat. <clears throat> We can actually trace the evolution of this in the fossil record a little bit. We have this species here, uh, 
of a, of a very early flatfish that has one head on the top of its or one eye on the top of its head and one eye on the left side of its body. And by the way, we think that the, the left and the right version species, we only think that this, this evolved once. We think that there's a mutation that can actually just cause the program, the developmental program to switch. So you get some species that are right, right-sided, some species that are left-sided. It's not fully understood, but it seems to be that, it seems like this, this weird adaptation only happened once. And all the species we have today are just variations of that. But again, just like what we see in the fossil record is what we see mimicked again in their development. You can actually see that, you know, the there, there's a there's a there's a a point in development when they're very similar to this this fossil species that we find. So that's really cool. It's really cool that we can actually see uh, embryology mimicking the fossil record in this way. And what this suggests is that this evolved gradually over time. And and if it's not super hard to imagine why this evolved. You, you, if you got a fish that's laying on its side a lot to hide from predators, because they lay on their sides so they can hide in the dirt. And uh, if you're doing that, one of your eyes is, is useless. And so if you have a mutation that makes your eye a little bit higher on your head, uh, one of your eyes <laughs> kind of crawl up your face a little bit, you only have to, to move your head a little bit to use both your eyes to see. And that can help you get some depth perception as you're trying to look around at what's around you. You're trying to you're trying to hide from predators and hunt at the same time. So you can lift your head just a little bit, which doesn't reveal you, your place very well, but allows you to use both of your eyes. It's also probably slightly dangerous to have one of your eyes constantly shoved in the gravel. You could poke your eye on something. You can get a parasite more easily that way. So there's a lot of different pressures that are going to be uh, in conflict with the evolutionary pressure to hide on your side. And so these both of these pressures could be could be causing natural selection to favor any mutation that causes that, that bottom eye to move upward and so that it doesn't have to be in constant contact with the sand. And then eventually you would get the eyeball on the top of your head so it doesn't have to be on the sand at all. But then that kind of screws up your depth, depth perception and then you get it to actually migrate so that both of the eyes are on the same side of your face. <laughs> it's super weird, this evolutionary transition. And it produces some of the funniest looking fish that you'll ever see. <laughs> like this, this, again, this is a Picasso, uh, nature's Picasso. And there's so many weird looking ones. This guy has got this stupid looking nose thing. It's not really a nose, but just... <laughs> But the things that end up happening here are bizarre. And then the, this has got to be my favorite. This looks, this thing looks like it's in pain. It looks like it's suffering. Um, I'm being asked, how is the flatfish body useful evolutionarily? They can, they can lay on the ground and they look like the substrate. I should have had, I should have got some pictures. You can kind of see in this picture, you see that the sand down here is it a very same color and texture as its as its skin that allows it to hide in the sand it's it's these things are almost invisible they're extremely hard to see you 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 can swim right past a 500 pound flounder or or a halibut i think i can't remember which ones get huge i think it's the halibut that gets huge you can swim right past one one that's bigger than you and you will not see it because it's hiding on the ground it, they're they they are amazingly good at camouflaging and this is because they're they're big and flat and you know you can imagine there, there's there's two ways that this could have evolved you could have had just a normal f fish get flatter and flatter but height wise but fish in general are tall and skinny and so the ancestor of the flounder was tall and skinny and instead of uh evolving to become flat, it would just lay on its side to hide from predators. And it's just that habit of hiding on its side was so useful that this weird adaptation of the eye migrating to the other side of the face ended up evolving because evolution is, is weird. It just, it takes what you got. You're always working with what you currently have 
And if there's consistent selection pressure to keep doing something weird, evolution will actually pull you to, it'll transform your body to make it easier and easier to, to do that weird thing that you were doing. You know, from generation to generation. Super bizarre how evolution works. And then, of course, the weirdest of all, in my opinion, is the tongue fish. <laughs> it looks like a chewed up tongue. So, anyway. Ah. There you have it, folks. That is my uh, internet safari. <laughs> Thank you for joining me on this internet safari to explore the evolutionary mitfit, misfits, the living evolutionary transitions that exist today. So, um, I guess, ah, oh, they did it for the halibut. Oh, classic, classic dad joke there. Uh, so, at the start of the show, for those who, who came late, I asked the question, how many species do you think are inside of a chocolate chip cookie? <laughs> and it's a weird thing to think of because uh, we don't normally think of a chocolate chip cookie as having species in it at all, but a typical chocolate chip cookie actually has multiple species in it. And this is the this is a, this is an actual cookie that I made this week. I actually took a picture of my own cookie, so I can make this slide. But the ingredients of this were sugar, white sugar, brown sugar, flour, eggs, butter, chocolate chips, baking soda, and salt. And if you add that all up, and if you figure out how many different species are in a chocolate chip cookie, turns out that there are what five species. You've got sugar cane which is the type of grass. You've got wheat, which is a type of grass. You've got eggs, so you've got chicken in there. You've got butter, which of course is made of milk, which comes from a cow. And you have the cacao plant, the seeds of the cacao plant, which make the chocolate inside the chocolate chips. So when you eat a chocolate chip cookie, you are eating a huge diversity of organisms from a really wide, uh, spread on the evolutionary tree. So anyway, I'm going to, I'm going to close things off here, but if anyone has any last minute questions or comments, please do write at space stated casually and I'll, I'll make sure to see that. Um, but again, there's a little bit of a delay between this broadcast. There, there's a delay here. So type your questions quickly or else I'm going to miss them. Uh, one question is, do species steal good evolution ideas from each other? Um, I guess you could say that, that some do in the fact that there is some, some cross species gene swapping. There's horizontal gene swapping from time to time. So I spoke earlier about uh, viral genes being used in uh, the placenta. And so, of yeah, we, we we do get we do get genes from other organisms, but we we don't steal ideas. So you cannot will yourself to evolve a new trait. Well, I guess you can in the fact that you can invent technology. So once your brain gets big enough and you can start inventing tools, then you can definitely steal adaptations from other organisms. We steal adaptations all the time. A lot of our inventions are are based on stuff we learn from animals. Um, so. Uh, that's one way to do it. Our species does steal good evolutionary ideas from other species, but uh, as far as genetic evolution goes, instead of cultural evolution and te technological innovation, you can't. A species can't just look at another species and be like, mm, "I want that." That's not how it works. Descent with modification. You have these what you what you can think of as random variations, and that, that there's 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 no foresight. And a variation. These things are just selected for after, after they appear. They are either selected for or against, and that's how evolution works. Um, how do marsupials fit into the transition between egg-laying animals and placental mammals? Uh, I don't know enough about that to to really give an intelligent response. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, not respond to that. But um, that is an interesting question. Uh, 
I think platypus fits that. So the platypus is the platypus is a primitive version of uh, they have a a primitive reproductive uh, method. So the platypus is laying eggs still, and it does that because all of our ancestors at one time laid eggs. All the ancestor of all mammals was an egg laying organism. We think, and we think that from uh, genetic analysis and really the position of platypuses and uh, echidnas on the evolutionary tree. We think that they represent a primitive uh, version of reproduction. Now, of course, whenever we're, whenever we're looking at modern animals, <clears throat> sorry, whenever we're looking at modern animals to try and figure out the, wh what our ancestors were like, we can't just map on what, what platypuses are doing and say that's how mammals used to do, right? Because the platypus has been evolving the same amount of time as placental mammals since since the split between um, platypi, platypi or platypuses? Since the split between the platypus and the rest of mammals, both lineages have been evolving for the same amount of time. And so we can assume that they're dramatically different now than the, than the ancestor was. But what happens a lot of time in evolution is that something that works well will just keep working and won't be changed that much in one environment. And then in some other environment, it, it will not work very well. And so it will undergo a rapid evolutionary change. Rapid. <laughs> when I say rapid, I mean millions of years, but you know, faster than the other lineage that's not under this new weird selection pressure. And so we can be fairly confident that the platypus reproductive reproductive method still does represent something similar to the ancestral form that our joint ancestors were using, if that makes sense. Um, <laughs> Diego asks, walrus evolution why do they make all those weird noises? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why walruses make weird noises. It's some sort, some form of communication. Uh, just imagine humans laying eggs. We are seven plus billion now. We would have been way, way more than that if it didn't take that long for a human to grow up inside its mother's belly. What a nightmare. Um, I don't know if that's true because... Well, humans do a lot of developing. Uh, we do a lot of developing before we're born, which I think you would have to do inside of an egg, which means you'd have to produce a huge, huge yolk. So having a placenta is cool because it allows the mother to keep giving nourishment instead of having to produce a giant yolk. Um, so, it, yeah, that's interesting. Would we... Would egg laying work? Uh, yeah. yeah the the, the trade-offs here are just... It's really hard to think about, and it's really hard because what's good in one situation depends on a bunch of things, including environmental pressures, but also just your own evolutionary history. What is your species currently good at doing, and what are the pressures in the environment and it's really hard to it's really really hard to to predict where evolution is going to head and to, it's really hard to say that one thing is actually better than another thing because everything is so dependent on context but yeah let's see Looks like that's all the questions here. Um, I'll get a couple more. How does DNA comparison? How is DNA comparison an evidence for evolution? By comparing DNA, you can you can you can tell who's more closely related to who, uh, and you can see how different proteins evolved and how different. You, you you can see that certain genes are turned off. So there's a bunch of egg pr producing genes in ma in placental mammals that are just turned off now. And so that's, that's evidence that our ancestors used to lay eggs. And then we see that confirmed in the fossil record. So DNA evidence is a really strong second 
record aside from comparative anatomy and aside from the fossil record it is a very it, it is a completely different uh, line of evidence that tells us the same story that we are all related and we can see these relationships in sequences of DNA uh, all right well I think I'm going to end it there this was a, this has been a fun day this has been a fun conversation hope you enjoyed it and next week I hope to have on a guest to talk about the philosophy of science what is a theory what is a hypothesis and how do different philosophers of science think about those things differently and think about the whole this thing that we call science differently so that's going to be fun so long till next